always said a storm was coming. Yeah. And it's almost here. Hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly Wallace, and we're here with a very, very special interview coming off the state of play for the reveal, the gameplay reveal of Horizon Forbidden West. And we have here two people you may recognize. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, my name is uh, Matthijs de Jonge. I'm the game director on Horizon Forbidden West. Hi, I, I'm Ben McCaw. I'm the narrative director on uh, Horizon Forbidden West. We have obviously a lot to talk about, so I will just get straight into it with the thing that really impressed us was um, the traversal equipment that you have, the grappling hook, the glider, and also that oxygen mask. I mean, is that the extent of all the traversal equipment that will acquire, or is there more than that in the game? There is more than that, and there's also uh, the free climbing that we added uh, to uh, the Forbidden West. Compared to the previous game, you are now completely free to climb anywhere on any rocks or mountains or cliffs. Uh, so we've really opened up the world and uh, made it more inviting to explore, even more inviting to explore. And I think with the grapple, it's really great to quickly go up to something and you can launch to go even higher then you can quickly descend with the, with the glider. So it's also a combination of some of these tools that make it feel very uh, agile and, uh, and, and fun to use. Yeah, it seems like there's a bigger focus on mobility this time around. How did you guys uh, come up with the ideas for putting like the paraglider, I should say the shield wing and the pull the caster, wing. you know, how did those come <laughs> into existence? Um, well, at the start of the project, we uh, we tried many things in terms of traversal to uh, to, to make it more enjoyable. Uh, one of the, one of the small tweaks I, that I don't think anybody has really noticed, but we put it in the demo, is that in the first game you could uh, jump up and you would have a ledge that was just out of reach, and that was mm -hmm. kind of really annoying that you could not grab onto that ledge, even though visually it looked like you you could grab onto it. So that's a feature we now added to the game. Uh, we call it high vault, so you can actually reach those ledges and, and smoothly climb up. So there's a lot of kind of uh, quality of life in improvements that we made at the start of the project and we tried lots of different things with different weapons how we could quickly grab up or a zip line create your own zip lines or there's many things that we tried and the ones that we that we showed in the demo are uh, sort of the main ones that that really stuck stuck uh, uh, stuck with us that we felt like okay these working combinations they work well in the new environment that we have in the forbidden west um, and the shield wing, the gliding, is something that we tried already in the first game uh, many years uh, before it shipped. This is one of the first things that we actually tried. Oh, really? Uh, there that we prototyped, yeah, but we didn't uh, ship with it because also for technical reasons back then we couldn't uh, really do that. Mm -hmm. um, but now we have it and it works great. That actually brings up a good question about the technology and the PS5 tech and what that has allowed you guys to do for this entry. I think a lot of people are curious, how do you plan to take advantage of some of that, like the DualSense controller and the haptic feedback? Uh, what's new there with the tech? A lot of the development has taken place on the uh, PlayStation 4, and a lot of playtesting is also done on PlayStation 4. So we are ensuring that uh, owners of that console have a, have a great experience and that the game will look fantastic on the, that console. For the PlayStation 5, we can go much further, of course. Visually, we can add a lot more detail uh, graphically. Uh, the rendering technique for the underwater scenes is special on the PlayStation 5. It has extra details and extra uh, uh, systems, uh, like the wave technique is uh, better on that system as well. Uh, but for the, uh, and the, actually the lighting on Aloy on the PlayStation 5 is also has a uh, much more definition. Mm -hmm. um, we use a, sp a special uh, cinematic lighting rig uh, that is on the PlayStation 4, it's only used in cutscenes because we the game is not running and we have uh, less, uh, we have more processing power at the, in those scenes. But for the PlayStation 5, we have plenty of processing power, so we can have that lighting rig uh, always available. So she always looks great in the uh, with that uh, lighting setup, uh, traveling with her anywhere. Uh, and then, of course, like you said, we have the dual sense controller. 
which adds another sense of immersion uh, because you specifically with the weapons that are so important for combat in in uh, Horizon Forbidden West, uh, the uh, adaptive trigger. Uh, conveys the uh, sense of pulling the bow and uh, releasing the arrow much better than the, the dual shock control, of course. The haptic feedback is more immersive in that sense. And then we have 3D audio, which also is, is also great. Um, immersion is always super important for us when we are thinking about Horizon and are designing the environments and all the mechanics. We really want the players to kind of feel like they're there in that environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these uh, new peripheral uh, features like the the haptic feedback and uh, yeah indeed the, the also the 3d audio really help also with that uh, immersion uh, so they, they are a, a perfect match for horizon forbidden west in that sense yeah it looks fantastic uh we also saw in this trailer uh valor surges which you know you said adds a unique set of abilities um but and what we saw is that it knocked back enemies in the case of what we saw. But I'm curious, can you explain more about Valor surges and how they'll function in the game? What else can you maybe do with them besides that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Valor surges are a new addition, and um, the, uh, the where they, you acquire them via the skill tree, which also has been completely redesigned and repopulated with new skills. Um, the skill tree is designed to support many different play styles and each play style has valor surges that you can unlock uh, by spending skill points on them and then the player can choose which uh, valor surge is active at any moment Um, but uh, you might have noticed the bars that are in the bottom right of the screen there's two bars and one of the bars is uh, has to be full in order to be able to execute a valor surge move Mm-hmm. The way you uh, build up that uh, uh, Valor Surge bar is by playing tactically. Because if in Horizon, if you play tactically, you are rewarded with sort of uh, tactical combat XP. It's its, its own uh, points system. So every time you do like a headshot on a, on a human or if you do uh, remove a component from a machine, which is we count as tactical play, you get a little bit of uh, combat XP. And that goes into the Valor Surge bar. So by playing uh, tactically, you are rewarded by uh, being able to execute these powerful moves. So it's all tied together uh, in a way. Uh, and it's a big payoff moment uh, that you can use to advantage, like the 360 Blast, where which knocks back your enemies. That's um, one example. You mentioned the skill tree had been revamped a little for this um, entry. Uh, what are the different, you said to suit different play styles, is it still the same? Like I know last um, entry we had like Prowler and other, are there still those um, tiers or have you guys changed that for this? Um, yeah, we we didn't uh, redesign the skill tree a little. It's completely thrown out of the window. We kind of started over. Oh uh, yeah. So there's a whole new uh, skill tree. Also visually uh, everything, it's completely new. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time on making that uh, more, uh, yeah, giving giving more options to player and cool options to play with. Uh, which play styles and how it exactly works, I think that's something we go into later when we can actually show it uh, to you because it was not part of the demo, so I I, I cannot really explain it uh, yet um, in that sense. No, I look forward to learning more about that. That sounds awesome. Uh, it seems from the trailers that more variety has been given kind of to the melee combat. Are different actions tied to different weapons um, and abilities, or do you have the same melee weapon throughout this, the entire game? Yeah, the melee weapon uh, and the melee systems have been uh, greatly uh, expanded. Uh, we now have uh, different combos that you can also acquire through the skill tree. And each combo move has its own specific uh, purposes. So uh, the one that you see in the, in the demo has a multiple hit and one of the last hits does, does extra damage. There's another uh, uh, combo move, uh, which we call the resonator blast. Uh, this is where you uh, build up a charge on the spear and you see the rings light up at the, at the end of the spear. Um, once the spear is fully charged, uh, you can uh, basically paste that energy onto your enemy and then target it with an arrow and that creates a massive uh, uh, damage point basically and a, a sort of an explosion on the enemy so you can use it uh, to take down the bigger enemies. 
so there's a lot more depth uh, and also because it's in the skill tree, there's a lot more growth now possible in the whole over the whole melee systems. Perfect. Now I'm going to get a little bit into the story. So Aloy kind of has a lot on her shoulders right now, right? There's like this red blight, a storm incoming, this rebel faction that can override machines. What can you tell us about her journey and how will it resolve some loose ends that were left in the first game? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, you are 100% correct. Uh, Six months have passed since... uh, the events of Horizon Zero Dawn, and that entire time, Ayla has been on a mission. She has, of course, noticed the red blight that you see in the announced trailer and also in the demo footage, and she knows that this signals the degradation of the biosphere, which uh, spells a lot of trouble for the planet. So she's been uh, spent the entire time uh, trying to figure out what's going on and how to stop it. And that mission is going to take her into... The Forbidden West, uh, a kind of mysterious frontier that's uh, alluded to in the first game. And uh, when she gets there, uh, you're absolutely right. She's going to get a lot more than she bargained for. Uh, New tribes, uh, new enemies, new machines. Uh, and, uh, but also some, some, some good things, uh, some, some, uh, she's going to be reunited with some old friends. You saw Aaron, of course, in the demo footage and also some brand new companions as well. So is Aaron, uh, so we saw Aaron obviously, and we've also seen silence in the previous trailer. Um, is it safe to say we will see more returning characters from the first game? You will absolutely see more returning characters. And you will uh, meet some new companions that I think um, I think players are really going to enjoy. Uh, what about the new companions? Do you like do you have anything you can say to kind of tease what's interesting about them? Well, you know, this is something that we thought a lot about mm-hmm. Um after after the last game came out. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was really increase the amount of time that Aloy gets to spend with her companions. So uh, this um, is true uh, on the main quest. Uh, as Aloy ventures into the Forbidden West, it's also true of the side quests. Mm-hmm. So the, you know what we really wanted was a lot more face time. And we wanted people to really grow that emotional attachment that they had with their companions. That's been a major focus uh, for, of development for us on the story side and on the quest design side. As far as the identities of those companions, yeah, I, I really wish I could tell you. I want to tell you so bad, but I can't. Well, why uh, why bring back Aaron in particular? I mean, why wouldn't you bring back Aaron? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, Aaron uh, is... It, I, I, Aaron, in a lot of ways, seems to be a fan favorite character. Um, but I have to say, you know, on the writing team, he's absolutely uh, a writing team <laughs> favorite character. Um, he... Uh, he he's just fun, you know, and, and he's kind of like a big kid. Uh, his dialogue is always fun. It's fun to write, but he also has, there's, it also masks a lot of pain, you know, and I think that's something that, um, makes him just very entertaining. Um, in terms of why did we bring him back? Uh, I mean, all those reasons, but also he fulfills a very specific role in the story. Uh, and also, um, you know, we absolutely needed uh, ties to Aloy's past to make her to to sort of make sure that she's the same person and then she's she sort of comes alive in the same way. At the end of this trailer, we did see a big like world map and some other points. Um, is it safe to say, like, are we going to be in San Francisco this entire adventure? It seemed like we'd be moving around to some other places. Well, so, you know. Here's the thing. Um, Iconic American landmarks are uh, part of the DNA of Horizon. This was something you saw um, across uh, Zero Dawn, and it's definitely going to continue uh, throughout uh, the Forbidden West. In terms of San Francisco, you know, we just couldn't wait to imagine uh, uh, San Francisco a thousand years in the future, you know, overgrown with nature, filled with all these dangerous machines. It just seemed like such a natural extension of what we had done in the last game. But um, it is uh, that only scratches the surface of what you're going to see in the Forbidden West uh, as 
Aloy kind of ventures into this uh, dangerous frontier, you're going to see uh, many, many, many more locations. And some of them are, are going to be ones you're going to recognize. Can you maybe discuss some of the different biomes we're going to see in the game and how they're different from maybe the areas that we explored in the first game? Right. So we can't really go into detail other than to say, you know, you see in, 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 in San Francisco, you've got this kind of warm, almost tropical climate. And there's a portion of the map that's devoted to that. Um, but that's only one of many, many uh, terrain uh, types and climate types that you're going to see in the game. Uh, and, you know, it, it's going to run uh, the gamut. So you're going to, you know, if you like the frozen wilds, there's some, <laughs> there's some pretty cold places you'll get to visit and there'll be some, some surprises as well. You guys teased at the end of the state of play that we're going to be learning more about the workbench soon. Um, you know, how is that? You don't have to go into huge detail, but how is that going to kind of change the way we upgrade weapons this time around? Uh, yeah, the workbench is indeed a new addition, and uh, it's an interact. It, it's something that we place in the settlement, so players will have to go back to settlements to interact with it. And the idea is that uh, you go out and uh, basically acquire resources from nature, from animals or plants, or from the machines, and bring them back to the workbench in order to upgrade your weapons. And outfits as well, by the way. And you can upgrade them over multiple steps. And upgrading them uh, enhances their uh, attributes or their uh, damage points, etc. But it also unlocks uh, specific new skills on the weapons, on di different weapons, or new uh, damage types, uh, ammo types. Uh, so there's a, yeah, it, it's it's a lot more elaborate than what we had before with just the mods that you could slot into a weapon. Cool. And the last thing that. Um was a big talking point coming out of the state of play is the release window, obviously. Um, we noticed there wasn't a 2021 year on it. Is you're still going to expect it this year, or have you guys kind of shifted away from that? The development is on track. And uh, the thing is just is like these are just strange times mm -hmm. uh, that we're all in. And we have never... Uh, finalized and shipped the game under these kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly calculating our schedules and looking at, okay, where are we? And are there any unforeseen things that might happen? And we just want to be super confident when we uh, announce the release date that we're actually going to hit it. Uh, so we just need a little bit more time and then we can come back with a, with a, a final release date. Let's just leave uh, our readers with a little something to... to um to think about with, is there any opportunity that we see a shark mechanical beast in this game? We're, we're underwater, right? <laughs> There's gotta be a shark, come on. Um, if, if, if people paid attention to the uh, live stream, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, the countdown that we had before the state of play uh, demo, there was a new uh, machine being uh, hinted at. Uh, it wasn't a shark. But it is an aquatic uh, machine, amphibious machine, I would say. All right, also people. scary. Very also scary. scary and very big as well. All right, people, go back and look at that and investigate so we can figure out what this next new machine is. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, um, for tuning into our interview. You can like, share, and subscribe at youtube.com slash Game Informer.